from Music for All and presented by Yamaha, it's Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, a practical web series for all music educators, embedding SEL into music education. On this episode, Composing with Heart, we welcome composers Brian Balmages, Brandon Boyd, Richard Saucedo, and Alex Shapiro, with special guest Bob Morrison. Please welcome the host of Teaching Social Emotional Learning Through Music, Scott Edgar. Hello, my name is Scott Edgar. Welcome to the premiere episode of Teaching Social and Emotional Learning Through Music, sponsored by Music for All. I am so thrilled to be joined today by such a distinguished panel of both composers, policymakers, advocates, where we're going to start talking about how do we make the connections between social and emotional learning and music education as explicit as we can. You've probably heard the term SEL peppered through uh, webinars, through initiatives coming from your district, the state, the national levels, more than the last three months than you ever have. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I already do this. Some of you are thinking, well, how do I embed this into what I'm doing into my band, choir, and orchestra rehearsal? And some of you are thinking, oh, what am I gonna do in the fall? I have no idea what this is gonna look like, and you're asking me to do one more thing. The purpose of this time together is for us to start to dig into people's brains and start to say, here's how we can do it so it's organic. Here's how we can start to develop some common vocabulary. And while I firmly believe that our music education classrooms and our ensemble rehearsal rooms are the perfect place to foster SEL, I do believe we can embed it better and we can make it more intentional and more purposeful so that we are able to truly maximize the benefit of music. You know, this is not one more thing. This is not something that we need to put on top of uh, what we're already doing in our classroom. If we start to think of it as music, 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 stop, SEL, music, 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 we're not doing it right. And that's why we're going to start picking the brains of composers. And that's what this series is going to be all about. It's going to be looking at where the music starts and what was in their brain when they created some of the great music that we are performing and preparing. Because we know performance is probably going to look a lot different this fall than it has been. We're going to explore that today. You know, many people call it different things. Some people call it social emotional learning. Some people don't. Our job here is to start to develop that common vocabulary and through this, finding ways that we can translate social and emotional learning as a construct for what we're doing. Building on these discussions from the composers, we hope to treat this very similarly to the classic book series, Teaching Performance Through Music. That's what we are all after here. We are just going to show you entry points for teaching social and emotional learning by talking to these uh, composers and these fantastic educators. We're gonna start off today, we have a very special guest and we're going to kick it off today with Bob Morrison who I am very, very thankful to be able to call a friend and a colleague. We've worked uh, together starting to think about what social emotional learning and music education looks like. Uh, you know, a dear friend of mine once said, all roads go through Bob Morrison and it is so true. Uh, the work that he's done tirelessly in the past three months to facilitate reopening, to facilitate best laid plans, to prepare, to get us all to think in a way that we can be successful this fall has been very, very powerful. And we all owe him a debt of gratitude. So with that, I've asked Bob to talk about why SEL now more than ever. So Bob, if you could help us through this initial part. Sure. Thanks, Scott. And, and thank you, everyone, for being with us. And I'm certainly honored to, to be here on this very distinguished panel. I, I feel like I'm the outlier here with all these uh, fabulous composers, musicians, uh, and I'm the token drummer in the room. So that uh, someone has to do it. So that's my role. Uh, what I want to talk about is why now is really, uh, it, and, and why music education, why arts education? Uh, and I want to start with a quote from Arts Education and Social Emotional Learning Outcomes, uh, a report that was released by the University of Chicago. And it says that the relevant question is not if an arts practice will affect a social emotional competency, but how it will happen and what arts educators can do to improve the odds that the impact is positive. You see, we do have an impact on social emotional learning with our students. The question is, are we having an impact that is positive, negative, and is that uh, impact intentional? 
Now, what's important to understand is that while SEL has been a movement that's been around for 25 years, it's only been the past few years where it's really gained some steam. And it started with the release from the Aspen Institute of a report called From a Nation at Risk to a Nation at Hope. And there they were looking at social emotional learning and character development. And one of the things that they talked about was the need to embed SEL throughout the curriculum. So as Scott mentioned earlier, we don't, you know, music, 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 stop SEL, but it's about how do we embed SEL into everything that we do. Uh, and one of the points in that document, one of the pillars that they recommend is how do we make sure that we embed those programs into our schools. But the report that I cited before from the University of Chicago has some research base underneath it uh, that talks about the fact that the the foundations for young adult success are really built around two areas, developmental experiences and developmental relationships. And we know that in music in particular, we have some advantages with developmental experiences and developmental relationships because from a relationship standpoint, we see the students more than anyone else. If you think about an elementary school music teacher, they see those students from the day they come into the pro to this building to the grade when they leave the building. So four or five or six years, they're with that student. So they have the advantage of time. But from an experiences standpoint, my God, the arts are rich with experience and music education is all about these meaningful developmental experiences that our students have. So as a result of that, it, it's clear that within arts education, we have these advantages that, that because of the social nature of the arts, because of the emotional nature of the arts, that we have a, an ability to activate this in our students in a meaningful way, but to do so, it has to be intentional. Now, why now? Uh, well, the big reason why now is pretty clear. Uh, there has been, uh, you know, over the past uh, four months now, since we've been uh, in the pandemic period, um, our students have gone through a lot. They've, they've missed out on a lot of things. They've had family members that have had health concerns. Uh, they've had a, a lot of their own personal loss to personal milestones, whether those milestones were graduations or concerts or musical performances or musical theater activities. They've had a lot of these uh, milestone moments that have been taken away from them. So they've had their own sense of trauma uh, to a certain degree. And when we come back from, from this period, when our schools reconvene, most of our students will have been out for six months. They won't have seen their teachers. They won't have seen their friends. Uh, they've been li living in some sort of isolation for an extended period of time. And as we've seen personally, you know, it, it takes a toll. It has taken a toll on our teachers, it's taken a toll on our parents, and it has certainly taken a toll on our students. So it's no accident that all of our administrators, our school administrators, and all of the state guiding documents about how to open our schools successfully and all the district plans are embracing social emotional learning as a cornerstone of how they reopen the schools. So as a result, our music educators, our arts educators are very well positioned to play an important role in the sex successful onboarding of our students back into the, the classroom. Because the one thing that we've heard over and over, we've learned a lot about what we can do uh, in this remote environment, but we've also learned what we can't do. And the one thing that we can't do in this environment currently is play together. And that is the thing that our students have said time and time again, that they miss the most. They miss the opportunity to play together and that connection. And so this is where we have an important role as music educators to play, uh, but to do so, to do it effectively, we have to do it with great intention. Thank you so much, Bob. Sets the stage beautifully for this fantastic panel of composers, band, choir, and orchestra composers, some people crossing over, and everyone's gonna be able to give us some insight into what the creative process from composition to music to education pedagogy and to ultimately reaching into the hearts of the students is gonna look like. We are thrilled to have acclaimed composers join us today. Brian Balmages, 
Brandon Boyd, Richard Saucedo, and Alex Shapiro. We're going to kick it off today with Alex because the biggest question that a lot of people have is, especially related to this, well, I kind of already do this argument, is that SEL is a buzzword. You know, we've been, you know, I've had my door, my inbox knocked down more times in the last three months than I ever have with people looking on how to do SEL. And it's because it is that buzzword, but it's so much more than that. And Alex, when we were talking before our, our time together today, you mentioned that it's not a box that you check off. It's not something that you want to make sure that you don't try to say, oh, I have to cross off the SEL box. It's just part of how you write. And a quotation you gave was, you want our students to be full human sentient beings and, and that, that really spoke to me so if you could talk a little bit about if you don't call it sel what else do you call it and how does that manifest in your compositions sure thanks thanks this is a wonderful discussion this whole thing and i'm so happy to be a part of it what i call it is real life it is real life and all of us as educators as music makers starting from the composer on through what we're doing is we're giving these students and the musicians in general a portal where it's a portal inward to their heart and it's a portal outward to the world it's you used a great term scott earlier when you were speaking you said organic and that's what this is. We don't have to work at it. We have to just be connected to the world around us. And by being so, naturally, that comes through in our work and we can give opportunities for that connection to students. I'll give you a couple of very quick examples. Uh, I've got one piece. Uh, it's a grade two, uh, but it's played by people of all ages. It's a weird minimalist piece uh, all about geology and climate change. It's, about, it's called rock music. And the first thing I have the players do is go outside, away from their screens, look down onto the ground around them. And you can do this whether you're in a city or in the country or anywhere else, uh, and find two rocks. Find two rocks that you're gonna play as a percussion instrument along with your own instrument. It's an electroacoustic piece. Um, and come back and incorporate those rocks into this piece. It's, it's such a simple thing, but getting them outside and connecting to nature, to geology, to the to, you know the ground on which they're walking, is huge. That's a very you know easy thing to do. Another piece is called Moment, which is for older students, and that one addresses. It's a fairly you know somber, melancholy piece, and it addresses uh, you know arctic drilling and smoke belching into the air and wildfires raging and climate change again and environmental issues it can be about nothing but if you ask the students for instance to put together a slideshow or videos that represent some of this suddenly it becomes a really powerful affinity building experience for them so it's not just the music it's what we can do and one of my interests uh, has always been multimedia and bringing in all kinds of other visual elements and sometimes physical elements into the music that we're providing the students. That to me is SEL, organic. Alex, I love it. Uh, and what, you know, as I said, part of my job here is to translate uh, what we're hearing for the language of SEL, for the teachers who say, the district's telling me to do SEL. How do I make this work in my classroom? And what I'm hearing is responsible decision-making and social awareness, being aware of the world that is around you. And if the pandemic has done anything, it's locked us into social isolation and what that looks like with this computer, and then to make good decisions in terms of climate crisis and what that looks like. So thank you for giving that tangible example for what this can look like when we're working through those pieces with our students. Would anyone else like to speak to other things that you call it? Yeah, Brian. So uh, it's a great, it's a great conversation. Um, and Alex and I have been doing a lot of this together. Just we've been having a, a ton of conversations and I've, it's interesting how much I thought I knew. And the more I talk with various people, the more I realize I don't know, um, which is great. Uh, and that's kind of the, what we that's why we do what we do. Um, when we talk about SEL, to, to me, I could sum it up in one word, and, and that word would be musicianship. Um, because what is SEL? It's social, it's emotional, and, and learning. And, and wh what better to describe social and emotional, this idea of communication, this idea of collaboration, than music? And, and when we talk about the emotion side of things, really, in my mind, when we talk about SEL, really what we're doing is we're finally saying to people, look, we've been so worried about so many things. We've been worried about concerts. We've been worried about 
adjudication. We've been worried about the grade that we're going to get at festival. We've been worried about whether we can go in at this grade or that grade. We've been worried about how am I going to get my band to the beach and how am I going to get them back again? How many chaperones? And, and those are all wonderful things to get kids involved and connected. But at the end of the day, we've got to worry about music and we've got to worry about playing with emotion, right? I think everybody in the world would agree that the most profound performances we've ever heard are the ones that musically just destroyed us, right? Whether it was out of excitement or out of, out of, out of sadness or whatever it might be. And what greater opportunity to bring this back to the forefront than to use the buzzword. But to me, the buzzword is really just bringing us right back to the point of music to begin with, which is to play with incredible emotion, with incredible social awareness and connectivity between every member of the ensemble and the conductor. And so I think that's something that this is kind of like a recentering, right? This is going to recenter us and bring us back to that point of departure that I think so many of us, myself included at times, have gotten a little too far away from. Home run, Brian. Absolutely. And, you know, I think this is something that a lot of teachers are having to grapple with right now because we've set a standard. We've set a bar and the pandemic has destroyed that bar, you know, in terms of what we've traditionally sought after in performance. And people feel that having to adapt that is lowering the bar. And the answer, uh, and I think we're going to get at this uh, at a deeper level in just a little bit, is because that bar doesn't exist, that gives us an opportunity to set a new bar at a really, really high level. Uh, Brandon. Uh, Scott, like, yeah. Yep. I did. I had something to say as soon as Brian started talking. He kind of made me think of something that happened recently. So I'm spending some time with a, a former piano professor, and uh, she is the joy of my life because I believe she taught me that it was okay to have an emotion um, about a performance of a piece you don't like. I mean, you can still yet have an emotion about it. So anyway, we're sitting at the piano not long ago and um, sight reading, she has um, dementia, uh, but we, it doesn't matter. So I was playing something for her and I was sight reading through some of her music and oh God, I got to a section, I knew I couldn't play it well. I knew I could play the chordal structure, but maybe all the dexterity, who cares? So. Anyway, when I got there, I just started blocking it out, chunk, 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 chunk. And I just, you know, just kind of apologized to her. She was sitting right about here. And uh, uh, she said, well, the only thing I could complain about it was, you didn't like what you played. And she seriously looked at me like, it doesn't matter, but play with some kind of feeling. And I'm thinking, I thought she was immediately going to tackle me on this piece that she knows from memory about me not playing all the correct pitches. Her concern was not that. It was a matter of, no. I mean, that was not good because of not the notes, but because you had no emotional investment in it. And that to me says that what's the point of doing this if you're not going to have some kind of emotion? Now, it can negative or positive. If you're not going to feel some kind of way about it, but then you expect someone to feel a certain way about the music after you finish. How do we know that? We cut the music off and you anticipate something behind you. Applause, right? And so those are the things that that kind of you you know you 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 forget a little bit as a teacher because you want to get all the right notes, all the right this and all the right that. But sometimes it's it's just that idea of being connected so much to the music that you do have an opinion about it and you do have a feeling about it because you are human, and that's the aspect of all of this that's most important. Is we are. We have to be by ourselves right now, you know, and that is one of the levels in our lives of just being happy with who we are. That's the way you can connect more to the music, because if there's no happiness here, it's external forces are things don't always bring us that complete happiness. And so that's some of the responsibilities we still have as teachers. Brandon, absolutely. And I think the biggest challenge challenge. that many of us have, and especially our students, is that they don't have the vocabulary to say how they're feeling. You know, if I walk into a a classroom and say, hey, how are you doing? Fine. Okay. So our first job is to expand their emotional vocabulary. So that can be a musical discussion and an interpersonal discussion and a personal discussion. So thank you for highlighting that. We need to be able to articulate how we're feeling. Absolutely. All right, I want to transition a little bit now because SEL is all about life skills. It's about a tangible skill that we can learn preventatively before a challenge. So just how we learn um, how to have proper vocal technique and how we learn how to do a, uh, a B flat scale and how we learn how to shift on the violin. Those are skills that set us up for repertoire. SEL 
gives us skills to set us up for life challenges. So I want to start by having just a little discussion about what life skills do you think should be the priority for us to teach, either it be latently because they're just in a great music ed program or purposefully, what life skills do our students take away from our music education classrooms? And we're going to kick this one off with Brian, um, who really has a, a lot of music that gets at basic human needs. Absolutely. And, and so um, I, I guess when we talk about the human needs, emotional needs, um, one of the things that I do a lot of work with is United Sound. Um, I'm, I'm on their national advisory board um, with Julie Duty, who does amazing things. Um, and, and of course, one of the things that they really do is they try to incorporate um, uh, ways of learning for kids who don't learn the same way that other kids learn. They learn differently. Um, these might be kids with autism. They might be kids with Down syndrome. Um, uh, there could be all uh, select mutism. There could be anything. And, um, and these are kids that normally would not really be able to participate in their music programs. And when I started thinking about what they are doing, pairing um, mentors up with, with these students, um, it came up and uh, there was a, um, uh, one of the websites that deals with Down syndrome was talking about the fact that these really aren't kids with special needs at all. They're kids with human needs and they have the same human needs that all of us have and we're just not meeting them right now and we've got to meet them. And, and that really kind of explodes onto this world of now we have a whole world of kids who are learning differently. They all have to learn differently. And so we've got to meet all their needs now in a different way. Um, what do we want to teach them through music? Well, I think one of the life skills that we talk about, number one, is the ability to communicate, right? Um, uh, when we get together as an ensemble, in the old days, when we used to come all together into one room and make music, one of the things that was a challenge was okay we're all from different areas we're from different cultures different backgrounds different everything and sometimes different levels of ability and we've got to come together in a very short amount of time we've got to be able to say something in unison we've got to be able to come up with a statement that reflects the collective whole of us and that the sum is much greater than just the individual parts put together and i think that's so important you know i always talk about how it would be amazing if our government, if, if, if everybody in power had more recent experience in an honor band or an honor choir and an honor orchestra, because we're putting people from all over together and they've got to come up with a consistent message and work together quickly, right? Sometimes in hours. I mean, sometimes in just a day. And so I think that's an important life skill. Um, the other thing I think is really important is to be able to respond to the people around you. If you are a flute player, a soloist maybe, and there's a clarinet soloist that's playing right before you, you have to be able to hear what they're saying before you can play. You can't just pick up your instrument and play. You've got to hear what they're saying and respond to it. Because if you don't, the music sounds disjunct. It doesn't sound connected. There's no continuity in it whatsoever. And so these are just two very basic things, but again, they're human things. And especially as we get back into even a hybrid model, the interaction, the ability to communicate is going to be one of the most important things that we have to deal with because there's a lot of things we can do. We can teach rhythm when they're at home, right? We can teach breathing a little bit when they're at home, but we got to worry about the communication. What Bob said, they want to play together. They want to make music together. And so these are the life skills that I think we really want to target, right? This idea of being able to respond and listen to each other and then answer each other uh, in an appropriate uh, and musical way. Absolutely, Brian. Thank you for that. Um, you know, as you were talking about the United Sounds, my mind came, went to this idea that no matter what we're doing, we need to adapt. We need to adapt our SEL lessons. We need to adapt our musical instruction to meet as many students' needs as possible. And we know that those needs are going to change. And we know that our students' needs this fall are going to be profoundly different than our students' needs were three months ago. As we're navigating this, we're going to have to shift into another gear. Uh, and thank you for your thoughts about communication. As you were talking, I'm hearing social awareness. I'm hearing empathy. I'm hearing respectful communication. Uh, so absolutely, the, the fertile ground for music education. 
home run. And I do want to say one thing, if I may, before we before I get off of this topic. But United Sound, the other thing that I want to mention, and again, it's not about United Sound, but it's about the idea that here there is a situation where we have all these kids that learn differently that we wanted to be able to incorporate. However, the immediate look is that the teachers look at that and they say, that's impossible. I have too much to do. I have too much going on. I simply don't have enough hours in the day to address, even though it's important to do it. And then the idea of thinking creatively where the teachers aren't the ones doing it, it's the students that are doing it. It's the students, the peers that are interacting with them. And so not only are these kids that have different ways of learning, not only are they now playing an instrument, but but they're forming relationships with the same people that weeks ago may have seen them in the hallway and kind of averted their eyes and just kind of kept walking, right? Or that wouldn't want to eat lunch with them because it just felt awkward. Now they're going up to them and they're giving them high fives. They're writing to each other over the summer as pen pals. They're doing all these different things. And so I think it's important that all of us have to remember that there are creative solutions. There are ways forward. They might not be the traditional ways, but that's okay. We are all creative creative people. That's why we became musicians. So let's harness that creativity going forward. Absolutely. You know, uh, the, my mantra that's kind of coming to mind is we need to take a step back so our students can take a step forward, that there's a lot of things that we've done in a podium centric way for a long time that if we start to say, OK, I'm out a little bit, the students then have space to take the step forward. Thank you for that great point. Richard, did I see your, uh, you had something? Yeah. Um, on the United Sound front, too, just real quickly. Uh, we did get to, I was fortunate enough to be on the first board of United Sound. Um, and uh, it's obviously, as Brian was saying, a very, very special group, great opportunity for students uh, that wouldn't normally get those opportunities to play music, especially instrumental music. But I remember hearing from a parent once who was saying, uh, I, I said, what's so special about um, this situation with your daughter uh, being in United Sound? She says, well, the music part of it is great. She said, but the best part of it was the fact that I had usually been my daughter's only friend for years and years. And the other day, she actually got a phone call from one of the kids in the band that she's playing in asking her to come to a birthday party. And this mom was in tears saying, that's something that my daughter learned right away is there are people that are willing to talk to her, even though she's different. You know, and I, I think um, United Sound has done so many wonderful things in that area. The other thing that I wanted to say also is I think we need to make sure that we're taking advantage of our opportunity as music teachers uh, on the SEL thing, because I'll just tell a quick story. Uh, I had one of my principals came down at one point and um, a wonderful principal, very supportive, but he came down, he said, Richard, I, I, I want to ask your help with something. And I said, sure, John, you know, what, what is it? And he said, I come down to the band room and he said, I see kids involved, engaged, working together, et cetera. And I go to an English class and I don't necessarily see that. You know, I see the front row kind of engaged, the back row might be sleeping, et cetera. And he said, how can we make that the same? And I kind of looked at him and said, John, that's going to be, that's going to be a tough assignment. He says, he kind of got upset. He goes, well, what do you mean? There's got to be a way to figure it out. I said, the differences in our band room, player A can't be successful unless player B is successful. And so there's this empathy, there's this feeling about the other players that's so important that you don't necessarily have in academic classrooms. And he understood immediately. But I think that's something that we need to remember to take advantage of in our music classes is we do have those opportunities. We have wonderful music like by, by Brian Belmages. We have, we have all this great music, you know, that we can use to get our kids to understand how to work together. And I think that's really important. Absolutely. And when the administrators start to take notice, that's when we know that we've hit the home run. We've actually made the difference for them to come down and start to use us as the examples. And this gets at what Bob was saying, that, you know, the world is starting to say, hey, the music teachers, that's where SEL can really live and that where it can live really, really well. Wonderful. Anyone else have some thoughts about life skills? Bob, what do you got? Just one thing real quickly. One of the things that we saw in the, the springtime as we went into kind of pandemic mode uh, was the fact that all of a sudden our students were largely responsible for their own learning. And so the whole idea of uh, personal responsibility, self-directed learning, uh, I, I think these are things that are going to be, they're critically important for them 
as they grow older and they go into college, because then it really is kind of self-directed learning. You are responsible. But now we're seeing that that responsibility is moving to our students as they return to school. So many of them are going to be in blended environments. We're hearing now many of them are going to be not, they're going to be completely remote. So the whole idea of making sure that we prepare them to be good self-directed learners so that they can practice those things that they can't do when we're together on their own and develop those skills so that when we are together, we can focus on the thing that we can only do when we're together. So I I'm really believe that one of the big things coming out of this is how we empower our students to be incredible self-directed learners, self-guided learners. And, and I think as a result, they can Im improve in leaps and bounds as a musicians when they understand that they can own their, their, their own learning. Fantastic, Bob. And, you know, this is resonating with me. I'm, I'm a college band director and, you know, I've already been told there's no concerts this fall. So even if we can have some format where we're rehearsing, we don't know those answers yet, but we know that there's no concerts. So that leads to my next question uh, for, for the panel that if, that if performance comes down, if performance comes down, how else would you like students and teachers to engage with your music in a way that could be meaningful, possibly capitalizing on creation uh, of music or responding or connecting those other national core art standards. When performance comes down, the others are going to have to come up. So let's start with Brandon on this one and maybe thinking a little bit about how much you value empathy in the classroom and what that could look like in terms of getting students to engage in a non-performance focused way. Um, well, I think as I have, I guess, tried to get a rhythm in my own teaching and classroom starting out just in college about three years ago, um, one of the very first things I noticed is my choir members coming in, sitting down, basically staring at nothing, uh, especially if they're new members. I mean, they stare at this imaginary nothing because it's like they don't want eye contact of some sort. They don't want any attention brought on. And I walk in the choir room and it's completely silent. I know you, you think that's quite ironic for choir people, but at the beginning of the year, that's how it starts. And immediately it, it would not go away from me for at least two or three weeks. And I thought, how in the world? This is not normal. Um, and so I started doing something in my choir. It was called checking temperatures. And that's the very first thing that we do is check temperatures. And if it's not the first thing we do, then it's the last thing we do to make sure that it's incorporated within the rehearsal time. What does that mean? It means to just, I give you a number, everybody has a number, out by row, by whatever, by section, and uh, you find another person and you two check each, other, each other's temperatures. And if there is something that I should know and you feel comfortable, that person, your partner, will let me know. Well, I thought, now how can I do this if we're not meeting? Hmm, you can do it virtually. And so creating time and space for them to be in their groups and things like that. So we've, we've been able to assign numbers the same way and allow students to touch base with each other based on their number or based on their whatever. The, you, you can use whatever you, you need. But it's just that moment that you are have a responsibility to someone else's need or concern. And that, that you start to feel proud about it. You know, you start to feel happy that you can be someone's listening ear because it might be two weeks or three weeks where there's no concern of yours. You're just a listening ear. But then eventually you may need someone just, hey, I want to vomit on you, just healthy in a healthy format and tell you some things that are going on in my own personal life that that just helped me. Wow, I didn't know that would make me feel so good. So those kinds of things, even though we're not in front of each other, we're not face to face with each other, uh, though there are so many methods. I mean, of course, we have group chats. We have all kinds of ways to connect our students. But it's normally from us, the same model that we have in the classroom as a conductor, from us to them. But now making sure that that web is now spanning, that they have that same connection between each other so that they can continue to check each other's temperatures, to just to see how they're doing, to see uh, you having any challenge with, with the music. All of those things will help bring a connection between two humans. Now you can disguise it by, hey, you know, you, you have any part issue, you have any, whatever, any concerns in your family? Because one of the things I didn't realize was there were so many kids who were affected by our international students who were affected by COVID-19 that it affected them in a much bigger way on the front end, especially some of our Asian students and our American students didn't realize it, you know, 
just just didn't realize it hadn't hit home yet. And you could see that once they started interacting with each other, they could understand that, wow, someone in our very choir has a family member who's affected by it. Now all of us, I'm sure, can say we know a student, we know a neighbor, we know a family member, and ho hopefully none of you, but maybe one of you have been affected by it. So just by te checking temperatures helps keep us connected. I love how you love said, how you said that, that when we're looking at what this looks like, it could look like checking parts. It could look like something musical. Um, so other thoughts from the panel about how maybe we can engage with your music in a way when performance takes a step back. Brian. Uh, when we talk about this new performances and how do we want people to interact with our, with our music, I think the, the, the first thing that you have to say is that that statement, it has taken me a very long time to get away from the paralysis that that statement causes me. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's not, it wasn't all roses and great uh, at the beginning because I, like many people that are watching this and like many of us that are on this panel, I'm a musician and, and my life, a big part of it centers around my ability to make live music. And, and when you start introducing that question, that it's, it's paralyzing. And, and I think it's important to validate that it's okay to be paralyzed by it. And it's okay to have a wall that you run into repeatedly. And, and, and I run into it still plenty of times. Um, the thing that really kind of helped me transition out of that is the day that I realized we keep focusing on performance, but the reality is none of us are band directors. None of us are orchestra teachers. None of us are choir teachers. We're music teachers. We teach music and those ensembles are one of many vehicles that we use to teach music, but they're one of many. They are not the only. And I think the other thing that we all have to remember is that like I'm sure, again, all, a lot of us have a lot of experience in working with various groups, either in a residency or as an honor conductor. And one of the things that I go through every time is this idea of the, the journey is so amazing, right? That journey of rehearsal, all those moments are so incredible. And the concert is like a love-hate thing, right? We, we love the concert because we're showing everybody what we know. We're showing everybody what we've done and who we have become as a collective entity. But we hate it because every time you conduct another downbeat, you're that much closer to everybody going away again. And, and we've all heard the post-honor hangovers, right? That all the kids experience when they go back to their own schools. And, and so I, I think it's important that we realize that we're actually more excited about the journey than the concert itself. Once you can kind of get a handle on that, then you can start looking at how else do I want to um, have people interact with my music. And I'm hoping Alex will chime in here because she's got all this electroacoustic stuff that she's doing, which is way above my head. Um, um, but it's awesome. And the way she envisions people interacting with it. Um, for me, what do I see? Well, like, you know, a lot of people know that, that Alex and I are part of this group called the Creative Repertoire Initiative, which is simply a group that is trying to inspire every composer out there, right? To every composer to create something that's adaptable. And so how do I want people to interact with my music? Well, if they're looking at these adaptable pieces, I would love nothing more than the kids to get involved in the orchestration decisions, right? Because in, in this fully adaptable world, every kid has access to every part. So the tuba player can see what the flute player might be playing and the flute player can see the bass line and how fun for the kids to be able to say, you know what, today we're gonna put flute and tuba on line one, thinking that, oh, that's, I'm a comedian, that's gonna sound awful. And imagine their surprise in certain combinations when they realize, whoa, that sounds awesome, right? And hey, we're gonna have out saxophones, you play every line and see what happens. And in this section for these eight miniatures, let's just have trumpets play and then just trombones are gonna play. And suddenly the kids are making compositional and orchestration decisions in how the piece plays out and how cool that every time they come back to class, the piece sounds different. It might be the same piece, but it sounds different every time. If they're in a funky mood, then they play a funky instrumentation. If they're feeling B flat generic or in 
orchestra D generic or in choir, lots of sharps generic, fine. They can do that too, um, but they can choose the textures and the combinations that kind of reflect their mood and what better way to connect emotionally. So that's another option of how I can see people doing things. And then Alex, of course, has the entire um, electroacoustic options and, and all that, which is really awesome. That's right. You, you know, Brian, um, so you just hit the home run when it talked about voice and choice, that a key part of social and emotional learning is giving the students voice and giving them choice. And that's something that we're starting to really value in terms of what these flux arrangements are bringing to the table. So thank you for that. Uh, sounds like tag, Alex, you're it. <laughs> tag, exactly. I want to double down on what Brandon and Brian just said, because we're talking about community, we're talking about engagement, we're talking about students connecting. And Actually, even though we, we all know we need the pheromonal in-person connection, that it, nothing will ever replace that, Zoom or you know whatever web presence is a way to keep them connected, very definitely. Um, starting off of what Brandon was saying regarding community and, and, his, and the choir members checking in with each other, um, early on in the pandemic, in the middle of March, when the University of Washington and all others <laughs> shut down and UW was one of the first because it kind of came out here first. Um, the director of bands, Tim Salzman, who many of you know, great, great guy, he contacted me out of the blue and he said, I've got 200 ensemble members and I want to keep them playing their instruments and I want to keep them connected to each other. What do we do? And he said, I think maybe composing, improv something is in there too. So we devised a syllabus that got them a whole semester through of connecting with each other through sharing motivic ideas and creating a sonic quilt, so to speak, of a pieces together. They created that together. And more recently, the piece uh, that I created in response to the CRI, the, com the uh, Creative Repertoire Initiative, uh, boost to get so many composers, and boy are they, creating pieces for this need specifically to engage students, to give them maybe some programmatic SCL based stuff to hang their hang their hat on and to give and to make sure that band directors and ensemble directors will have music for whatever combination of students become available to them uh, in the fall and beyond because this probably isn't going away quite as soon as we'd like. I, I just finished a piece, it's behind me right here called Passages, where along doubling down on what Brian was saying with his approach to, to his piece, which is awesome, I have one page of music. It's only one page. There's no score. On that page are 10 different lines ranging, ranging from grade two to grade four in difficulty, mix and match. They all sound good, whether they're played together, separately, in any combination, against an undulating, very uh, lovely, I hope, <laughs> uh, set of chords that progress for two minutes, three minutes, excuse me, three minutes long. Um, and no matter how they all play and which lines they choose to play, it will all sound, hopefully, really cool over the track. And they can play this at home. They can play it as a soloist uh, and improvise over it. So it's geared toward any instruments, anything. The parts are in every clef and every transposition, as you might imagine. Just hand them out and away you go. So it's something that will hopefully engage them and encourage them and keep them creating, you you know, keep them creating in their own way. So community and engagement. I absolutely love how you're giving a space to create within this new piece. That's fantastic. Thank you for that. Brandon. Uh, well, you used the term earlier, voiceless, and, I, and I'm sure some feel that way. But my, my biggest, pr most proud moment ever in life was, um, was, a, was a commission. And I think it was my first commission, I'm the one you actually get paid for. You know, people will commission you, and it's just a gift. But my very first commission was um, from a wonderful ensemble in New Mexico, and it was to write a piece that uh, the text was written by a poet V. I knew nothing about poet V other than I got the text. And once I got there, I learned much more about this young lady who was um, a 15 year old girl and she was incarcerated in a det detention center. And I was given all of this text by students who were incarcerated and I just flipped through and I flipped through and I got to a piece called I Search that to me, the, the text that I, I thought was one of the loudest cries I've ever heard in my life. It was saying how she basically was representing every child 
especially during that 12 to 15 to 16 year old range, trying to figure out who I am, where I'm going, you know, all of these things. And in that text, I heard her advocating for those students who are at home uh, with family, but they're gay, they're at home with family members who despise their who they who they are who they say they are or how they feel they are um with students who are experiencing so much um um disadvantage let's just just put it in that category of being disadvantaged and um in writing this piece i had never thought of myself as disadvantaged in some way i i guess i would thought i was privileged um because of the things that she was going through and i'm saying all that to say during that experience, I think it took me back to to that time as a child to go, wow, so many kids come in our classrooms to escape from some of those realities. And now they're kind of back in those realities full time with no pay or benefits. And it was a moment I looked at the piece. I never published a piece, but I've always thought, should I publish this particular piece? And now that I have come back to that piece three years later, I'm looking at it to say, golly, this young lady was a representative three years ago, but I know there's so many more students who are out having these experiences right now. But basically in that experience, being a poet, being able to express herself through literary terms, she was able to give one you know, one part of her experience. And then as a composer, I was able to join forces with her to, to give another aspect of this to maybe devile and then to give this, as someone used earlier, the term where we basically are, uh, I can't, can't think of the term right now, but we are transporters, that's not the term, someone said it earlier, but it's basically for us to give a gift to the audience. And that is sometimes our deepest emotions, our deepest feelings about the music that, that we perform. Form. And, you know, three years later, I'm feeling that, wow, I think it's finally hitting me, the power of that particular text joined with the music that I was given by my creator to, to be able to help that, that voice go even further. That's a great, 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 example great example of what it looks like when we are able to put music at the center of what we're doing from an SEL standpoint, from a music ed standpoint. So great example there. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the panelists today and Bob Morrison, especially for being our special guest and allowing us the opportunity to start to explore the connections between social and emotional learning in music education. This is only the tip of the iceberg and folks, we have a lot more to talk about from this panel. So stay tuned, part two is coming when we're gonna talk about some fantastic subjects, including Richard Saucedo talking to us about what it looks like when a music teacher is starting to unpack this work that Brian just introduced to us. And we start to talk about how do you start to have those conversations that might be difficult? How do we engage in difficult conversations that we need to have in music education and music can start as the entry point. Thank you very much and we'll see you next time.